Welcome, Ben Mama. This video is brought to you by a compendium of Sega Master System and SG-1000 games, Volume 1, by Kieran Hawken and Retro Originals Publishing. This paperback book is available to purchase worldwide and features 180 pages of 8-bit Sega awesomeness with over 300 game reviews from 80s and 90s classics to modern homebrews, three amazing developer interviews, Sega history, fascinating facts and trivia, and so much more, making it an essential companion to these classic home consoles. It's available exclusively on Amazon right now, so why not go and grab yourself a copy? I'm still surprised that it's taken us this long to get to an amazing Sega Master System facts video. Given the huge popularity of the console and the strong support for all things Sega on this channel, that has already seen me cover every single major Sega console and add-on. The two previous times it was included in a poll, it finished as the runner-up despite taking an early lead. But this time round there was no mistake, as it won outright against the RCA Studio 2, VTech Creative Vision and Nintendo Game Boy in an absolute landslide. The most decisive vote I've seen thus far actually. First released, Sega Mark III in Japan in October 1985 as the replacement for the now two-year-old Sega SG-1000, it was rebranded as the Master System for its Western release the year after. The main reason for creating the SMS, as it's often called, was to build a system that could better compete with the Nintendo Famicom and indeed its Western counterpart, the NES, without alienating the existing Sega user base, hence why it was an upgrade of the existing hardware rather than a whole new system. It went on to be pretty successful for Sega, well, in several specific regions anyway, which I'll go into in due course, building a platform for them to launch the hugely successful Mega Drive and Genesis a few years later. As such an important console historically, there was certainly plenty of information I could cover in this video, but I like to think that I've selected the best highlights here, as you'll find out very shortly, as I now proudly present 10 amazing Sega Master System facts. Sega challenges you with the ultimate video game, the Sega Master System, with twice as much memory oh, yeah? as any other video game. Advanced video technology like scrolling backgrounds, graphics in 64 colors, digital sounds, and light phasers. And you can add to the excitement with sports pads, control sticks, and the first video games ever in 3D. Sega's the one. The Sega Master System. The challenge will always be there. I was going to start off these facts by talking about the console that came before, the SG-1000, because without it there'd be no Master System. But then I figured that I'd spoken about that a lot on the channel recently, and indeed I've already produced a standalone episode of Amazing Facts on the SG-1000 too, which I'll link down in the description for those who want to watch it and learn some more facts about Sega's first console. But what I'm going to talk about instead is the lineage, especially in terms of the naming conventions, because I'm sure that many people will know that the Master System was originally known as the Sega Mark III in Japan, and was only renamed the Master System when it was released in the West. Indeed, I mentioned it in the intro. The original model of the SG-1000 was of course released on the 15th of July 1983, the exact same day as the Nintendo Famicom of course, as well as its computer-based sibling, the SC-3000. But around a year later, Sega would release a new version of the SG-1000 in a much sleeker case with a built-in MyCard slot, meaning the card catcher was no longer needed, and also had the availability of a keyboard add-on to turn it into an SC-3000 computer, as covered in a very recent video of mine of course, which you may remember. This new version of the SG-1000 would subsequently be known as the Mark II, with the original model now referred to as the Mark I. So when it came to creating a new upgraded version of the SG-1000, it made perfect sense to call it the Mark III, especially as the original Japanese model used a very similar case design to the Mark II and was fully backwards compatible. But because the SG-1000 was never released in North America, it made no sense to keep the Mark III moniker for that market, 
and the Master System name was chosen instead. Incidentally, it's also worth noting that the code name used for the Mega Drive whilst it was in the development phase was indeed the Mark IV, probably because it retained a backwards compatible design, albeit with a converter, but more on that later. So I just talked about the SG-1000 and how the Master System was basically an upgraded version of the console that retained backwards compatibility through its very similar hardware. But I think it's important to point out what changed with regards to the Mark III that made it better able to compete with the Atari 7800 and Nintendo NES in the West. The Master System uses the same Zilog Z80 CPU as well as the same 3 channel Texas Instrument sound chip but when it comes to the memory, and even more so the graphical capabilities, we see some pretty huge upgrades. The SG-1000 featured just 1K of RAM, which was very restrictive, whilst its successor ups the main system RAM to 8K, and also gives the new graphics chip its own dedicated video RAM, a huge, for the time, 16 kilobytes. And speaking of that graphics chip, Sega replaced the old Texas Instruments chip from the SG-1000 with a new one that they had designed themselves, which was based on their Sega System 2 arcade board. Introduced in 1985, the System 2 was used for hit games like Choplifter and Wonderboy, which later appeared on the Master System of course, and its video display processor offered up a 256 x 192 resolution with 32 colours on screen from a palette of 64. The use of this VDP in the SMS also gave the console a toll-based display, much like the Famicom and NES, as well as an increased number of on-screen sprites. This was a pretty considerable upgrade on what came before, and certainly a big improvement on the graphics offered up by the Master System's great rival, the Nintendo NES. Back in the mid-80s, there were still significant tensions present between Japan and South Korea, dating back to the Second World War, where the Japanese had occupied the country. This meant that there was a complete ban on importing Japanese products into Korea, so manufacturers like Daewoo and Samsung found a way around this by licensing Japanese designs and manufacturing them in their homeland. But it's the latter of these companies, now best known for their TVs and mobile phones, that we'll be concentrating on here. Samsung's interesting history in the video game sector begins in the latter part of 1983, where they became the first Korean company to sign up to the MSX standard, releasing the SPC 800 computer the year after. They would then go on to release a second revision of this MSX1 hardware, as well as a host of software and accessories to use with it, including joysticks, monitors and printers. Then, in 1987, they signed an exclusive contract with Sega to become the official manufacturer and distributor of the Mars system in Korea, where it would be renamed the Samsung Game Boy. This venture proved to be incredibly successful for the company, with them even releasing their own games for the console and encouraging the development of many more by Korean software publishers, even if many of these were very dodgy from a legal aspect and certainly not approved by Sega themselves. A lot of these games were ports to the MSX in fact, as the Master System, through being an upgraded SG-1000, retained a high degree of compatibility with the standard, making the porting process very easy. In fact, the Sega deal was so successful for Samsung that they later went on to produce their own versions of the Mega Drive as both the Super Game Boy and Super Aladdin Boy, the Game Gear as the Handy Game Boy, Mega CD as the CD Aladdin Boy, 32X just adding Super as a prefix, and finally the Saturn, with no name change at all. They also produced the SVP chip used in the Mega Drive version of Virtual Racing for Sega 2, as well as numerous games under their own branding. I should also mention that Samsung produced their own version of the 3DO2, although this was a much less successful venture. Once import rules started to be relaxed in the late 90s, they pulled out the console market completely. As a legacy of its backwards compatibility with the SG-1000, the Mark III and indeed the Master System also featured a My Card slot which allows the console to play games in small rectangular slabs of plastic, not unlike the hue cards used on the PC Engine in fact, as well as cartridges. These are often ignored when people talk about the Master System, but they actually played a big part in the machine's success in Europe in particular, which is rarely recognised. 
One of the biggest reasons why the Nintendo NES couldn't succeed in the UK and Western Europe was the price of its games. At this time, the market was dominated by low-cost home computers like the ZX Spectrum, Commodore 64 and MSX, and gamers were sport by cheap, tape-based games that could be bought for as little as £2. European gamers looked at Nintendo trying to sell games like Contra, Green Beret and Donkey Kong for £30, when they could buy the same game for their home computer for £3. And it's not like the NES version was any more advanced in most cases. This is also a reason why Atari led the console market in Europe during the 80s, because towards the end of the decade, they were selling new games for the 2600 or 7800 for £10 to £15, the same cost as a full price game for a home computer, but with the advantage of instant loading. Sega, and in particular their main European distributor, Virgin Mastertronic, were very wise to this and looked at the much cheaper My Cards as a way to compete. They were already selling Master System cartridges for £5 cheaper than their NES counterparts, but the My Card format could be sold even cheaper still, hitting the £15 to £20 price point. In the early years of the Master System, My Cards were pretty prominent only being phased out once the Sega console had cemented its place in the market and built up a decent user base. Which is also why the card slot was subsequently removed as a cost saving measure on the later Master System 2 consoles. As an interesting aside, when the MyCard format was first unveiled, Sega's then head of consumer hardware development, Hideki Sato, stated that he disliked the design of the original cartridges, saying they looked like small black tombstones when inserted into the SG-1000 console, which is why he developed the new format. He even stated in a more recent interview that his proudest achievement of the 8-bit era was indeed creating the cheerier pocket-sized MyCards. When I think of the Mars system, the first thing that comes to mind is the sheer amount of different add-ons that it had, certainly more than any other console of its generation, and you could also argue that it had some of the most successful add-ons too. This is probably why Sega became so obsessed with the concept in the following generation too, which played a big part in their downfall. Probably the most popular accessory was the Sega Light Phaser, designed to compete with Nintendo Zappa, but looking much more cool and futuristic. This light gun was also included in the deluxe version of the Master System package along with Sega's own take on Duck Hunt, Safari Hunt, but it was supported by plenty more games too, including conversions of popular light gun based arcade games like Operation Wolf, Space Gun, Terminator 2 and Laser Ghost. This pretty much made it an essential item for every single Master System owner. Next up we have the pretty revolutionary 3D glasses, which sadly didn't work that well for everybody. I have to admit that I could never see the effect properly myself, but for those who could, it gave games like Missile Defense 3D, Space Harrier 3D and Outrun 3D a whole new dimension. There are even games that combine both the 3D glasses and the light phaser. There were also plenty of different controllers too, including the rather strange Sega control stick that could be twisted round for left-handed players, the Sega Sports Pad, which was basically a scaled-down trackball controller for use with the so-called great sports games, the Japanese only paddle controller, which wasn't well used but was nicely implemented on Woody Pop, and a range of different third party options, including flight sticks, arcade style joysticks, and turbo pads. Another Japanese only add on that definitely needs mentioning is the FM sound unit. This remarkable device contains a YM2413 FM synthesizer chip, combines with the existing SN76489 PSG chip to offer up 9 mono sound channels. It connects to the Mark III through the console's front expansion port and offers a huge upgrade on the existing audio. When Sega chose to redesign the Mark III as the Master System, they included the FM sound unit as part of the main board in all Japanese consoles, but rather strangely omitted it from the Western version of the machine, and nobody is really sure why. We can only assume that this is a way to bring the cost down, so it's more competitive price-wise with Atari and Nintendo, but it seems a baffling decision. Thankfully, it's now possible to add this add-on to Western Master System consoles, and it's well worth doing so, because there are around 60 games that support it, and the difference in audio quality is pretty huge. But before I end this already rather lengthy segment, there is one more add-on I need to mention, but one that wasn't actually released, and that's the Sega Master Drive. 
I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this, but I've actually made a standalone video on the unit, and I strongly suggest giving that a watch, so I'll link it for you down in the description. But what I will tell you is that this was effectively a disk drive add-on for your Mars system that would have allowed you to save your progress in games, load much cheaper games from disk, and would have likely resulted in some sort of computer add-on too. A pretty exciting concept all round. You simply cannot talk about the Master System without mentioning its huge success in Brazil, and its manufacturer in that region, Tectoy. A lot like Korea, who I mentioned earlier, Brazil had a lot of restrictions on imports into the country, and often hit them with very high amounts of tax, effectively making the products unaffordable. This put a lot of companies off launching in the region, like Nintendo and Commodore for example, but encouraged others to find a way round it, like Atari and Sega, who both licensed their respective consoles to local manufacturers. But Tectoy, who were largely known as a toy company, hence the name, and had previously distributed Sega's laser tag toy, took this to a new level, effectively embracing all things Sega like they were their own putting equal branding on all the products and even developing their own games and hardware that we never saw in the West. In fact, as far as Brazil is concerned, the Mars system was never officially discontinued. Such was the success of the machine, with plug and play versions featuring built-in games still being sold to this day, which I've long argued should be brought to the West as the Mars system mini. Amongst the many exclusive models, we have strange oddities like the wireless and very portable Mars system girl, the Mars system 3, and the controller-like Master System Handy, and in terms of Brazil-only games, we have stuff like Woody Woodpecker, FIFA Soccer, and of course Street Fighter 2, which is very impressive indeed. Tectoy would also repurpose lots of Western games to suit their home market too, such as the many Sapo Zor games, Chapel MX Dracula, and the Monica's Gang series, which were all Wonder Boy games originally. Not to mention the many titles that we only saw released for the Game Gear in the West, like Dynamite Heady, X-Men Mojo World, and Earthworm Jim, which were especially easy to convert due to the near-identical hardware. Such was their success in the region with the Master System, that in 1990 it was reported that Tectoy held just over 80% of the Brazilian console market, a pretty astounding figure. And this success continued with the success of the Mega Drive 2, which was every bit as popular. Tectoy recently reported that they have sold over 8 million Master System consoles in the region, four times as many as Sega sold in the whole of North America. Anyone who's into the Master System successor, the Sega Mega Drive, will be well aware of the excellent Power Base Converter, which allows you to play SMS games on your 16-bit beast, including both cartridges and Sega My Cards. Well, unless you own the much rarer Powerbase Converter 2, that is, which omits the card slot completely, much like the Master System 2 console did, in fact. But did you know that this wonderful add-on doesn't really do anything at all? That's because the Mega Drive hardware is already backwards compatible with the Master System, as there is already a Z80 CPU, there is a coprocessor, and the Mega Drive's VDP is an advancement of the one found in the SMS, and contains a mode that replicates it perfectly. Sadly, this new VDP omits the SG-1000 mode completely, however, so backwards compatibility ends with the Mars system. All the Powerbase Converter does is change the shape of the cartridge slot for you, so the games will fit. Yep, that's it. This is also why the second version of the converter manages to be so small. You can test this for yourself by simply using a Mega EverDrive cartridge and filling it with Mars system ROMs. As long as they don't use the SG-1000 graphics mode, your Mega Drive will play them flawlessly giving you an even bigger library to play around with. One of the things that's always talked about with regards to the Mars system is its built-in games. In fact, this almost became a trademark of the console as the theme continued throughout its long life, with a lot of different games being featured as part of the system ROM. All this began with the first model way back in 1986, and indeed this is one of the facts that is always brought up by people when they talk about the Mars system, because all models had a built-in game that was never actually publicised by Sega and could only be accessed by holding up as well as buttons 1 and 2 simultaneously. This game was of course the now legendary Snail Maze, where you were tasked with guiding a small orange snail through a blue maze and into the exit before your time ran out. Very simple, but actually quite challenging. 
Later models of the Mars System 1 also saw the two original packing games, Hang On and Safari Hunt, moved into the system's ROM, essentially giving owners a choice between three built-in games. Hang On was of course a pretty spiffing conversion of the popular Sega arcade game, and Safari Hunt was an original title designed for the light phaser that was created to compete with Nintendo's Duck Hunt and their Zapper Gun. The Master System continued with built-in games for its next iteration too, as the later Model 2 ended up swapping out one iconic mascot game for another. Early units contained the excellent Alex Kidd in Miracle World, undoubtedly the best game in the popular Alex Kidd franchise, and Sega's answer to Nintendo Super Mario Bros. But later versions featured the superb SMS edition of Sonic the Hedgehog instead. Some like to argue that the Mars System Sonic is even better than the Mega Drive original, not a view that I share I may add, but there's no doubting what an excellent game it is, it's arguably the best built in game to ever be included in a home console. It's a shame that Sega didn't choose to continue the built-in game tradition onto the 16-bit era too with the Mega Drive and Genesis, as there's no doubt in that it proved to be a big selling point for the SMS, especially in Europe. I've already talked about the huge success the Mars system had in both Brazil and Korea, so it's only right that we talk about its popularity in PAL regions too which includes the United Kingdom, Western Europe and Australasia. What is especially interesting about the console's European success is that it very nearly didn't happen, and almost ended in immediate failure. To tell this story we need to rewind back to 1986 and Sega signing a deal with several leading European distributors to launch the product on their behalf, including Master Games in France, Areola Soft in Germany and everyone's budget game favourites, Mastertronic in the UK. A huge advertising campaign was started to make the Master System the must-have games machine that Christmas, but due to some pretty epic incompetency by Sega, they failed to actually deliver any inventory at all to their European distributors until Boxing Day. The result of this was many angry parents who couldn't purchase the top item on their children's Christmas list, as well as wide-scale backlash from retailers demanding compensation. These troubles ended up putting both Master Games and Mastertronic into bankruptcy due to the financial mess they'd been left in thanks to all those lost sales. Thankfully, eccentric British balloon riding billionaire Richard Branson stepped forward to save both Master Games and Mastertronic, merging them into his existing company, Virgin Games. A year or so later, he would also wrangle the German distribution rights from Areola Soft 2. From here, the Master System went from strength to strength and soon became the industry leader across Western Europe. In fact, Sega was so impressed by the way Virgin Games marketed the console in this part of the globe, they actually ended up buying the whole company. If you want to guide just how successful the Mars system was in Europe and the UK in particular, in 1991 it was reported that it outsold the rival NES by nearly 3 to 1 across the whole region and UK sales ended at 2.2 million, which is more Mars systems than were sold in the whole of North America, which is pretty astounding when you consider the UK is smaller than most US states. It would be wrong to finish this video without talking about the Mars systems very own offspring, the Sega Game Gear. This came about through widespread panic at Sega, who needed to get a handheld console to market to compete with the Nintendo Game Boy and Atari Lynx, and needed to do it quickly. The simple solution was to miniaturise their existing 8-bit hardware, whilst adding a few extra features to try and bring it closer to the 16-bit Atari Lynx. The result of this was the Project Mercury, later renamed the Game Gear, and released in Japan in October 1990 a handheld console that kept the same Xilog Z80 CPU and three-channel sound chip but upgraded the graphics chip slightly to give it a palette of 4096 colours instead of just 64 and doubled the sound output to make it stereo. They obviously had to downgrade the resolution to fit the smaller screen, this didn't prove to be too much of an issue. It's fair to say that the Game Gear had mixed success, but this was certainly helped by the release of the Master Gear adapter that allowed you to play Master System games on the portable though this did cause some issues with regards to the resolution, meaning the sprites were almost impossible to see in some games. Early on in the Game Gear's life, it saw most titles released for both it and the Mars system almost simultaneously, but later on it got quite a lot of exclusive games that never saw release for its full-size parent. 
However, in recent years, most of these have been hacked and adapted to play on the Master System, so you can now download the ROMs for games like Buster Move, Samurai Showdown and Shining Force and play them from your Master EverDrive. It's also worth mentioning that in more recent times, there have been two different Master System specific handhelds released onto the market. The first was the Portable Player in 2006, which rather strangely carried Coleco branding and came with 20 built-in games including Sonic Triple Trouble, Alex Kidd in Miracle World and Fantasy Zone. Then we had the At Games produced Arcade Gamer Portable in 2010, which I've actually looked at on the channel before for those interested. I'll link this down in the description and this had 30 built-in games instead, adding classics like Sonic Spinball, Rystar and Golden Axe. There's also a couple of weird Sonic shaped plug and play joystick thingies, but let's just stop there shall we. Sadly, At Games never produced any Master System portables with an SD card slot, like they did with the Mega Drive and Sega themselves have never seemed interested in releasing any kind of Master System Mini in the West, even though it would be a simple task as they could just repurpose one of the existing tech toy devices. Hopefully that will change in the near future. Few people ever get to look death adder in the eye, or get to swap lead with Mr. Big, let alone work out how to deal with that jack in the box. There are over 100 Sega games from £9.99 to £39.99, and no one has ever beaten them all. Yet. And that rounds up my look at 10 amazing Mars System facts. But which one of these fascinating facts is your favourite, or do you have some of your own tantalising tidbits of trivia that you want to share? I always love to hear the thoughts of you the audience, so please get typing in that comment section. Before I go though, I must thank all of my little patrons and YouTube backers for continuing to support my channel and make videos like this possible. However, I must give special thanks to the following people in particular for their much appreciated pledges. Paul Daniel, Mins, Dos Gamer Man, Luke MC, Carl Olsen, Seth Robinson, Frosty, Mark Strickland, Glimmerton, Trogdor the Burninator, Dona Skronsky, Ben P. Stein, Tabby Kitsune, David Maddox, The Eyes Are Bleeding, Joe Kassara, Classic Gamer 74, Bernard Santu, Peter Grantham, Noah Mann, Josh Hartman, and Electron Star Collapse. If you also want to help support all my creative endeavours, including this YouTube channel, then please go and check out my Patreon right now. You can get access to host extra content including downloads, exclusive videos, creative insights and much more besides. I've been the Laird, I thank you for watching and I'll see you all again for another video very soon.